The killer shot him six times. And that crushed my dad? There were no fingerprints. DNA was, uh, was very early in its stages. There were no weapons found. This story tells the tale of millionaires who seemed to have it all, but destroyed their lives by doing the unthinkable. It was 1994 in Newport Beach, California. A splendid waterfront with multi-million dollar houses showed an idyllic scenery that almost anyone would dream to live in. This was the home of Bill McLaughlin. He was a millionaire investor in his 50s who had three children and a lifestyle that on the outside seemed pretty much perfect. He had a private jet and a house as big as a palace. But in 1990, Bill was just going through a painful divorce. Actually left the relationship and, and that crushed my dad. Looking for an older man, 30 plus, who knows how to treat a woman. You take care of me and I'll take care of you. It was Nanette Packard, who was nearly three decades younger than Bill and had two kids from a previous relationship. And Bill's daughters were not the only ones to have doubts about his new relationship. My age, yuck. Dad, you're dating this young chick? It boosted his self-esteem to have this young girl around working her magic and making him feel good. Bill's friends had a strange feeling about this deal, and they weren't wrong to think so. Nanette wasn't a pure young girl who just happened to enjoy Bill's money. Bill was about to find this out in the most tragic way. On the surface, things seemed to get better for Bill, but just then tragedy struck. His only son, Kevin, was hit by a drunk driver and suffered a severe brain injury. Kevin was now Bill's top priority. He wanted to make sure his son made a full recovery. Kevin made progress, but Bill never got to see it. It was December 15th, 1994. Bill came home from Las Vegas and had dinner with Kevin. Then his son went upstairs to put some music on. A few moments later, Bill came into the kitchen and his killer was waiting there for him. Kevin heard the gunshots and immediately went downstairs. He found his dad lying dead on the kitchen floor and he immediately dialed 911. But there was a problem. Because of his brain injury, he couldn't communicate properly. Call 911. Newport Beach Emergency, please fire paramedic. Kevin is simply helpless. He's literally watching his father die at his feet. It's heart wrenching. <laughs> The police eventually came to the scene and immediately started an investigation to find Bill McLaughlin's murderer. But the investigation was to last 15 years. Simply nothing made sense to the police. Who would have had the motive to kill Bill? There were no fingerprints. DNA was, uh, was very early in its stages. There were no weapons found. The only person who wasn't completely shocked by Bill's murder was his brother, Patrick. The night before getting killed, Bill had called Patrick from Las Vegas, and Patrick got a feeling something was off. I could tell right away something was wrong. He, he, had, he was in Las Vegas calling me. He was feeling as though he was, life was threatened. That's just the way he talked to me. But Patrick had no clue to give to the police. It was just a feeling. As months passed and the police weren't getting any closer to catching the killer, Bill's whole family lived in constant fear. We were very worried for our own safety. Who, yeah. has, who has done this? Are they after the family? Are they after my dad? For some reason, the police never took into consideration Bill's fiance, Nanette. A simple background check into her current affairs in the 1990s would have highlighted a big issue. Nanette had another relationship at the same time with Bill. She was dating Eric Naposky, a former professional football player. The shooter, it turns out, was a former NFL linebacker. Nanette and Eric had planned this murder for a while so they could collect Bill's life insurance of $2.5 million. Somehow, both Eric and Bill knew about each other, but they didn't get the full story from Nanette. What was the relationship with Nanette and, and Bill? Um, from what I gathered, it was kind of a mentor, um, almost like a father-daughter type thing, like a mentor. So you didn't see this romantic relationship or a boyfriend-girlfriend? 
No, I didn't. And, well, Nanette was actually engaged to Bill when Eric killed him. Um, well, yes, Eric knew about Bill, and Bill knew that Eric was my friend. He didn't know we were having an affair. He's, he knew that we worked out together and stuff. It gets worse. Nanette told Eric that she had developed a prototype that separates plasma from blood, and that Bill was her boss, then her business partner, as a result of this project. This was, in fact, Bill's prototype, and one of the reasons he became a millionaire. On the night of Bill's murder, Nanette had left him a note saying that she'd gone to her son's soccer game. That was the perfect alibi for police to rule her out from the investigation. In fact, Eric had an alibi too, and to this day, he maintains his innocence. He says on the day of the murder, he went with Nanette to her son's soccer game. Then he was going to his job at Thunderbird Nightclub when his beeper went off. His boss wanted him in Tustin. She put me in Tustin, which is 20 minutes outside Newport Beach minutes before the 911 call. I hate to burst your bubble, fellas, but I wasn't in Newport at 9 o'clock. Tragically, he was. Both Eric and Annette told lie after lie, while the police struggled for 15 years to unravel the story behind their evil plan. Luckily, Eric implicated himself in the crime when he boasted about it to his neighbor. This, along with Nanette forging Bill's signature and signing herself checks with a total of half a million dollars, were what the police needed to arrest them. As of 2012, both Nanette and Eric have been given life in prison without the possibility of parole. To this day, they maintain their innocence. This next story takes us all the way from New York City to Los Angeles, California, as we follow the cursed trail of Robert Allen Durst. He was born on April 12, 1943, and had grown up in quite the dysfunctional family. When he was seven, his mother took her own life by jumping off of the roof of their family home. When he was 10, he was taken to counseling after serious rivalry with his brothers, and the psychiatrist's report mentions personality decomposition and possibly even schizophrenia. Then what followed were decades of fights with his dad and brothers over the family's legacy, the Durst Organization. In 1992, the organization appointed Robert's brother Douglas to run the company after Robert's inappropriate conduct. Robert hated Douglas for it, and eventually he sued the whole family for his share of the family fortune. In 2006, he was bought out of the family trust for $65 million. By the 2000s, Robert's horrifying past would slowly come to light. It was Christmas Eve 2000 in Los Angeles when a woman called 911. While she was looking for her lost dog, she found something else. I wanted to know, we have her. The problem is, um, they gave us the dog and we went over next door to see if she's at home and her car's in the driveway. She's not answering her door. They're packing on our doorstep. She's not answering her phone. Her back door is wide open. So, I don't know what's going on. Soon enough, the police found the body of 55-year-old Susan Berman in her own home. She'd been shot in the head. Robert had been Susan's friend since his PhD in the late 1960s, but no one suspected Robert of foul play at the time. Tragically, no one suspected Robert until very late, when, in fact, he had a very dark history. In 1971, Robert met dental hygienist Kathleen McCormack. After just two decades, he invited her to share his home in Vermont. A bit after a year, they got married. In 1982, Kathleen mysteriously disappeared. Because I was basically saying, get the heck out. And she was afraid, but she thought she could handle him. Robert was never charged with Kathleen's murder, even though the police knew they were fighting and that Kathleen was seeking a costly divorce at the time. Kathy felt like somebody, I don't know who, I guess Gilberta, told Kathy that if she could prove that, that I'd been beating her up, she would get a bigger saddle of mine. As creepy as Robert's story was and is, without a body or physical evidence of harm, the police can't prosecute him, and Kathleen's body was never found. Skip almost two decades from his first wife's murder, it's 2001, and the LA police are investigating Susan's murder. Soon enough, Robert's neighbor in Texas, Morris Black, is also killed and dismembered. That's where Robert was hiding, disguised as a deaf 
mute woman. He had killed his long-term friend Susan, afraid that she would tell the police about him killing his wife back in 1982. She had known about it for a while and was now threatening to tell the cops about it. Now Morris had blown his cover. Robert shot him, then cut his body into tiny pieces and hid the pieces in various trash cans. Robert was arrested and stood trial for this murder, but his story was unbelievable. He said he shot his neighbor in self-defense, but admitted he chopped up his body. Cutting somebody up with a saw is a really difficult thing to do. I agree. But the police didn't have a lot of clues to begin with at Susan's home. We've got a shell casing, a 9 millimeter casing. We have a door that's been open. Uh, we believe it was opened by Susan. There was no force entry. So that's kind of the reason we believe that she knew who she was opening the door for. The police had a suspicion about Robert, but it was a 2015 interview that finally incriminated Robert. He just has diarrhea of the mouth. He just can't stop talking about these events. And it seems that in some way he feels the need to justify his actions. Why, why he was on the run. What happened with all these people who continuously seemed to die around him. In the interview, investigator John Lewin asked Robert about the story his defense attorney had told about Susan's death. According to him, Robert did visit Susan when he found her body. Then he grabbed his car and ran away from California. But. In the 2015 interview, Robert agrees that was bogus. What I'm telling you is, I'm, I'm just saying, that did not happen. You agree you did not just find Susan's body and somebody else killed her. You did not find Susan's body. Okay. There's more. After Susan's death, the police got a letter postmarked December 23rd, the date before her death. The letter was imprinted with her address and the word cadaver. The handwriting and the Beverly spelling mistake matches another letter Robert had written to Susan before. Somehow his defense attorney argued that Robert did write that note, but only to direct the police to Susan's body. Then the final piece of the puzzle came. Robert agreed to give interviews for a series called The Jinx, a 2015 documentary about Robert Durst's alleged crimes. Not only did Robert say too much, but right before the series' last episode, he went into the bathroom with an open mic and spoke to himself. What the hell did Rachel kill them all? Of course. His answer to this? A long weekend when I did the interviews for the Jinx. Yeah. I was on F the whole time. Finally, Robert was arrested and charged with the murders of Morris Black and Susan Berman. Sadly, his trial was on hold due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in January 2022, Robert died, aged 78. Tragically for all the victims' families, they will never get the closure or justice they deserve. This last story is about to get as upsetting as it can get. What Jeffrey Epstein did while New York magazines would praise him for his achievements, is simply heartbreaking. Epstein was born on January 20th, 1953, in Brooklyn, New York. He was always good with math, studying at Lafayette High School, then at Cooper Union and NYU, although he never graduated. In the 1970s, somehow he managed to teach calculus at the Dalton School, an expensive private school. He wore a fur coat, gold chains, and an open shirt. He wanted to be a rock star, but that's not all. Epstein was overly friendly to his female students and would sometimes crash student parties, trying to talk to girls in the hallways. Eventually, Epstein was fired, but he'd gotten what he wanted, the connections with rich and powerful parents, including Ace Greenberg, a legendary trader who worked at Bear Steams. This was a company that wanted men just like Epstein, who they called PSD, poor, smart, and deserious to get rich quickly. By 1980, he was a senior partner. He would only take on clients who had at least $1 billion in assets, and he would charge huge flat fees that earned him hundreds of millions every year. Meanwhile, he collected powerful friends with political power, like Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. In 2002, Trump said of Epstein, it is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. As creepy as this remark sounded back then, no one suspected how dark the truth really was. Did Jeff know anybody's real true age or he didn't care? 
I don't think he cared. He told me the younger the better. People thought that Epstein was romantically involved with Galene Maxwell, the daughter of media mogul Robert Maxwell. But as both Epstein and Maxwell were socialites, always going to parties and hooking up with younger people, people started to notice their relationship was platonic. Journalist David Patrick said, in one way they are soulmates, yet they are hardly companions anymore. It's a nice conventional relationship where they serve each other's purposes. Again, this comment hid a much darker truth. Maxwell would facilitate underage girls for Epstein to fest at his luxurious Palm Beach house. Those. She just seemed very nice and she said, I've got a person that I know who's actually looking for a traveling masseuse. Virginia was taken to Epstein's house for an interview, then asked to massage Epstein's back. Then he turned around. <sighs> That's when I was instructed to um, get undressed and um, and have this with Jeffrey Epstein while Gillen Maxwell was participating as well. This all started unraveling in March 2005, when a 14-year-old girl told her parents what she'd gone through. Immediately, her parents called the police and gave an official statement. Within the next few months, the police discovered hundreds of other victims, all young girls, who had been brought to Epstein's mansion, offered a snack, and then taken upstairs to the master bedroom, where Epstein was waiting for them. Jeffrey preyed on girls who were in a bad way, girls who were basically homeless. He went after girls who he thought no one would listen to, and he was right. He wouldn't just violate these girls. He would use them to recruit new girls, promising them large sums of money. He had created a cult with Galeen Maxwell at his side. Soon enough, Epstein had 40 lawsuits against him and charges to 200 crimes. But this was when his power and influence came into play. Over a breakfast meeting at the Marriott Hotel in 2007, his legal team managed to reduce his plea deal to an unreasonably generous offer. And that's one of the most, one of the most disturbing and, and really uh, shameful things um, that uh, people who should have known better, did know better, uh, turned a blind eye and, uh, and just let him continue. Epstein only pled guilty to two counts of soliciting prostitution from a minor. Epstein was given 13 months in a Florida County jail and he got to serve his time in a private wing with the freedom to leave the place and work from home six days a week for 12 hours a day. It gets worse. The plea deal meant that Epstein's case was closed and neither the local police or the FBI could continue to look into Epstein's gruesome past. It also granted immunity to Epstein and four accomplices from all federal criminal charges. This protected all of the rich and powerful men who were engaged in whatever Epstein offered them at his mansion. Years would pass and Epstein was free and living his horrifying criminal life again. Do you have any idea of how many victims are out there? I would say it's in the thousands. I mean, he was literally doing this for over 20 years. But in 2017, Julie K. Brown wrote a big investigative expose. Epstein had violated or molested 80 girls between 2001 and 2006. The New York police were now determined to put Epstein in jail, in a real jail. They tracked down his actions at both his Palm Beach mansion and his New York home, where he would host parties where other rich men could abuse the same minors. I was abused by people that I can't even mention here. There, there's a lot of scars hidden behind those walls. By July 2016, they had him arrested after finding hundreds of recordings of his horrors. He and Maxwell were charged with the human trafficking of minors. Epstein pled not guilty to all counts of rape, and he offered the judge a hundred million dollars to be put under house arrest. The judge didn't buy it. Epstein awaited trial. But on July 23rd, 2019, around 6.30 a.m., Epstein was found dead in his cell. He had hung himself. Galene Maxwell is in prison awaiting trial. Unfortunately, Epstein's quick exit means none of his victims will get the justice they need to carry on. We have to live with the scars of his actions for the rest of our lives, while he will never face the consequences of the crimes he committed, the pain and trauma he caused so many people. What do you think about these cases? Let me know in the comment section and before you leave, why not check out the other videos? Until next time, 
stay safe out there.